This is Duke University. All right. I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Matthew Adler. He is the Richard A. Horowitz Professor of Law here at Duke University School of Law. And his scholarship focuses on public policy analysis, risk regulation, and constitutional theory. Professor Adler is an editor of legal theory and the author of numerous articles and books exploring the integration of fair distribution considerations into policy analysis. He holds a BA and JD from Yale University and an MLit in modern history from St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. He clerked for Judge Harry Edwards of the DC Circuit and Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Welcome, Professor Adler. Thank you for being here today. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you to uh, Katie and to the Articles Board uh, 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 and the editors for putting together this uh, a great uh, symposium, present company excluded, and for uh, indulging uh, uh, my, and I'm happy to say, a shared uh, passion uh, for happiness. Um, so uh, 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 I will um, uh, uh, talk uh, uh, generally about the paper. I know a lot of people in the room uh, uh, have read it, uh, some have not. Uh, but I want to sort of go through uh, and highlight uh, sort of the main points uh, uh, as is true with many of my papers, uh, there are a lot of trees in there. There are a lot of trees in there, so I want to sort of give an overlay of the uh, 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 overview of the forest uh, 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 just to, um, to get that uh, across. So let me, um, uh, and again, uh, with apologies uh, 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 for those who know uh, 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 much, uh, maybe all of what I'm going to say. Um, there's been a lot of scholarship on happiness, right, which is really uh, uh, interesting. I mean, this burgeoning uh, literature on happiness, or uh, the term that's used in literature, uh, SWB, subjective uh, uh, well-being, uh, a somewhat more general uh, uh, term, uh, 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 starts out with uh, psychologists, uh, people like uh, um, uh, Ed Diener, uh, others in the field of so-called positive psychology uh, uh, reacting to the post-Freudian obsession with negative mental states, with anxiety and neurosis and so forth, uh, these psychologists started to look uh, at the sources of happiness, right, and feelings of satisfaction. Uh, um, uh, uh, that in turn uh, generated interest among uh, economists, uh, empirical uh, economists uh, pioneered uh, uh, by people like uh, Richard Easterlin and now lots of others. Um, uh, and what this field does, or at least the core of it, right, is to use these surveys, both cross-sectional surveys and so-called longitudinal surveys, right, surveys of people over time, to examine the sources of subjective well-being. I'll say happiness at some point, it's, it's, it's easier to say, uh, but in general, I mean to refer to uh, subjective well-being, which might be uh, uh, um, uh, a positive affects, it might be a sense of uh, life satisfaction, uh, it might be something else. Um, in any event, uh, what these surveys, or at least the first generation of surveys, uh, 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 ask questions about overall happiness, right? Ask people to reflect on their overall life circumstances uh, and then to quantify uh, their happiness Right, or their life satisfaction on a numerical scale. Right, so these are surveys about happiness or life satisfaction, uh, uh, but specifically, right, ask for uh, this quantitative or at least ordinal uh, uh, placing the mental state in a set of ordered, ordered categories uh, uh, assessment. Um, a Kahneman, uh, you know, pioneer here, uh, as with lots of other things, uh, objected to the sort of overall happiness or life satisfaction approach um, uh, and started to look at momentary affects. Right? He wanted to figure out uh, 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 what makes people happy or what changes uh, their affects on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Uh, and he did that uh, uh, not only through theoretical work, I'm going to talk about that uh, uh, a bit later in the uh, presentation, but also through empirical work. Right, trying to get at people's moment-to-moment -moment affects. And Christopher uh, talked about that uh, uh, in his uh, terrific presentation. Um, uh, ideally, 
uh, uh, perhaps. You do that through experience sampling, although you'd think that experience sampling, of course, is where you're given a, a, a beeper, uh, which beeps, and then you have to record your happiness. Of course, if you're really in the flow, that's going to, the interruption itself is going to skew your report. But th th this is still sort of seen as being kind of a gold standard, uh, very expensive. Uh, a different way to uh, get at these moment-to-moment -moment, uh, affects is through the so-called day reconstruction method. That has been uh, implemented by Kahneman and collaborators, and I say Kahneman, but, you know, they're really eminent collaborators in the group as well, Arthur Stone, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Kruger, who's now the head of the uh, Council uh, of Economic Advisors, uh, uh, did a bunch of uh, big studies uh, using this day reconstruction method uh, where people were asked to uh, recollect uh, the episodes of uh, uh, the day at the end of the day, uh, um, uh, uh, to chunk the day into a series of episodes, and then to rate those on uh, uh, effective scale. So one study, uh, women in Texas were asked uh, you know, over a series of days to, to recollect all the episodes during the day. Were they commuting? Were they working? Were they uh, um, uh, uh, doing housework? What have you. Uh, and then to rate each episode on a series of both um, uh, negative and positive, uh, positive affect scales. So how happy were you during that moment? Uh, how uh, angry did you feel? How frustrated did you feel? Uh, uh, and then Kahneman and collaborators took those numbers and averaged them. Uh, a more recent study uh, done, again, basically by the same group, uh, um, uh, uh, did pretty much the same thing, uh, but rather than cate uh, you know, uh, categorizing each moment into... Uh, uh, rather than giving it a, a cardinal number, uh, simply uh, 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 using these sort of momentary effective scales uh, uh, categorized uh, each, uh, or had the participants categorize each moment uh, as either predominantly negative or positive in uh, uh, affect. All right, so I could talk more about that, but there, you know, we know this, there are these surveys both overall uh, and momentary, and what's been, this is what, what's gotten the economists going here. This is big data. <laughs> this is big Data. If you are, you know, a, 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 an empirically minded, econometrically minded economist, there's a lot of stuff to work with, because you can ask people not just about their happiness, right, or life satisfaction. You can ask them about lots of other attributes, right, um, and then you can correlate them, right. And indeed, uh, um, uh, the uh, standard overall questions there are questions that are asked. You see that up there in these big cross-sectional. Uh, um, uh, social surveys, the general social survey, where people are asked a gazillion questions, right, about income, marital status, uh, health status, uh, religion, lots of other things, and this happiness question, and then we can do correlations, right? And that's been, I mean, I'm going to talk in a second about the policy uses of happiness data, but the core of this literature, still the bulk of it, has been this, you know, in effect, purely positive right, descriptive, explanatory question about the correlation, right, between characteristics and uh, 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 happiness, uh, either in the effective sense or in the life satisfaction sense or perhaps in the momentary sense, right? And nothing, I mean, I want to concede that this, this is, whatever one's normative views, uh, this is extremely interesting and extremely important, right? Uh, it's worth thinking about, it's worth taking account of uh, in policy, uh, Easterlin, uh, I assume everyone in the room is aware of the famous Easterlin paradox. Uh, Easterlin found that although within a country at a given time that happiness does seem to increase with income, he found that within a country over time that average happiness does not increase with average income or uh, 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 um, uh, 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 GDP per capita. So, for example, although Japan's GDP per, per capita has doubled many times since 1945, uh, average happiness has, has, has gone up. And Eastland also found that cross-national right, uh, comparisons at the same time, right, uh, that countries with larger uh, GDP uh, per capita above a certain threshold do not appear to be more happy. Now, that's been challenged. There's the wonderful literature trying to figure out, is that really right? Is it really true if you look at not just the income and happiness, but log income and happiness? Is it true uh, if you do bigger data sets? Is it true uh, if we use life satisfaction as opposed to uh, effective measures? This is extremely interesting and important, right? Uh, just one bit of this literature. Another bit of it, uh, 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 I was uh, 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 on a panel with some people in the room here uh, 
uh, in the fall on taking account of uh, employment impacts right, in a policy analysis. There is no question. One of the interesting findings in this literature, now it's clear uh, adaptation was mentioned, uh, Carol mentioned adaptation. Uh, there appears to be adaptation to lots of things. There is not adaptation to unemployment. Right? Unemployment is a bad thing in the sense that you become unemployed and your happiness drops um, and it doesn't go back up. And if you're reemployed and then unemployed down the road, you become even less happy. Right? I mean, this is really something to uh, uh, think about. Uh, uh, certainly, as a positive matter, something that we want to be aware of. Uh, Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers now at Michigan. Uh, uh, in a lot of ways, they've done a lot of great things in the literature. One, they have this big study that challenges Easterlin, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, empirically. Uh, they also have this uh, study that they presented at Chicago a number of years ago, looking at female happiness in the United States over the last 30 years. And what they find, well, they don't give an explanation, but the data, you know, seems to show pretty powerfully that uh, at the same time that, of course, women uh, uh, legally and practically in the United States uh, uh, were liberated, had many more employment opportunities, life opportunities, that female happiness goes down, both absolutely and relative to men. Wow. Right? Now, why is that? There are lots of things we can talk about. We can talk about uh, expectation. We can talk about rescaling. Uh, we can talk about frame of reference. Don't know, but this is an important, interesting thing to uh, take account of. So there's a lot. This, this is a wonderful literature. Uh, uh, again, the bulk of the literature is not about uh, policy, it's about simply looking at these uh, uh, correlations. Coffee makes me happy. Uh, <laughs> although there is adaptation. Um, okay, so what I want to focus on, and we're a little more skeptical, uh, is uh, uh, the use of these surveys for public policy. Right? That's what's on the table uh, here, uh, uh, and I want to applaud. Uh, 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 John, Chris, and John uh, for uh, uh, helping to bring this to uh, the fore. It's also been out there in the literature as well, uh, 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 but they're helping to make this you know, something which is going to be front and center uh, for uh, law professors. Um, so uh, what's been the thinking about possible policy applications of um, uh, this happiness uh, data? Uh, actually, uh, and this is a little bit different than WBA, and we can talk about the difference. Um, but um, although the standard technique right, for um, cost-benefit analysis, again, standard cost-benefit analysis takes various kinds of effects on people right, and monetizes them, right, and in particular tries to come up with willingness to pay measures, and that is standardly done in two ways, either through revealed preference data, right, uh, market prices or other kind of behavioral data, or through so-called contingent valuation studies, where people are asked, how much would you be willing to pay for this? Or the so-called dichotomous choice framework, where people are given you know, one level of a good and a higher level but a tax, and are asked, which would you choose? Right? That is the standard way to do it. There are gazillion studies like that. But now there's a new approach, uh, uh, which has been used in you know, maybe half, uh, 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 sorry, several dozen uh, papers uh, using the happiness data to estimate monetary equivalent for various goods and bads. This has been done uh, for lots of different things. Uh, 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 the idea is, again, if we have this multiple regression data, so we got this big data, and what we do is put in, you know, standard kind of econometric equation where we got all these independent variables like income and air uh, quality and marital status and so forth, and We've got happiness in one or other sense as a dependent variable. Then we have coefficients. Right? We've got coefficients on the different independent variables, right? predicting the effect of those on happiness. Right? So the coefficient on income might be C sub y, which means that if you increase someone's income by a dollar, then that person's happiness goes up by a C sub why? Uh, while a coefficient on some other goods, the air quality, might be C sub G, which means that if you increase that person's holdings in some sense of one unit of that good, that their happiness goes up. And lo and behold, you got these things. You can then come up with a monetary equivalent for the non-market good. Uh, 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 that is the amount of dollars that produces the same happiness impact right, as the good. And this has been done. There's, there's, this is, this is you know, it, it's still a small bit of the attempt to monetize non-market goods, but this is something which is actually happening in the literature. Uh, 
Um, there's been, uh, no, the focus in this room, uh, uh, um, uh, I think representing the interests uh, of all of us, is on policy analysis, right, which is sort of the marginal question, right, we're at kind of an equilibrium and government is choosing a policy, should we do it or not? That's cost-benefit analysis, or WBA. Right? But obviously it's also important, I mean, there's a lot of foot thinking right now about sort of overall measures of a society's condition. Right? How is society overall doing now? What's the standard measure of that? Well, that's, of course, GDP. Right? But there's been a lot of interest. This is really the Stiglitz and Fatisi report is about policy analysis, but mainly it's about moving beyond GDP. Of course, the French and the, the Brits, who don't, go, don't, don't look so great on GDP measures, would like to come up with some other measure. Uh, 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 that's a cynical view uh, uh, for measuring social condition. But in any event, both coming out of that uh, uh, and independently in the literature, people like Kahneman uh, 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 you know, have worked on this. The idea is to come up with something like gross national happiness. We can look, just as we look at the time trend in US GDP, or across national comparisons you know, uh, in GDP or GDP per capita. So we could do that in terms of uh, happiness. Um, of course, we have, uh, uh, this is, I mean, one of the great things about, uh, 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 um, I'm going to call them BBM, uh, uh, as work, just to be quick, uh, is that uh, um, uh, what, they're, what they're suggesting is truly novel. right? This is different than uh, either uh, the thing at the top there, or gross national happiness. Um, and as I've suggested, I mean, there are various governmental efforts. Uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the UK is already, the ONS, which is the statistical office in the UK, is already polling, engaged in a program of polling people about their happiness, collecting happiness data the way that, you know, uh, governmental statistical offices now standardly uh, collect unemployment data and lots of other kinds of data. That's already happening. Uh, in the UK, uh, Carol Graham at the back of the room is on a panel uh, 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 to get that underway or to think about how to do that uh, in the US. Um, and I already mentioned the Stiglitz and uh, Fatusi uh, report. OK. So that's the happy news. Here's the bad news, or what I'm trying to do in this paper. Um, I think this is wonderful stuff. Certainly, I think the empirical findings are really, really interesting. Um, but it's been conceptually sloppy, right? It's been conceptually sloppy, uh, and it's been, it's given too little attention to the vibrant philosophical literature about well-being. Now, I think a lot of this is a consequence of specialization, right? The folks who do this are really good at their empirics. They're really sophisticated in terms of handling big data, in terms of the econometrics, or they're really good psychologists. Right? They don't grow out of the philosophical tradition. They don't worry about the kinds of conceptualizing you need to do right, to do good normative philosophy. One of the great things, I mean, there are lots of problems right, with the British economists of the generation of Cowder uh, and Hicks and uh, uh, folks like that. But one of the great things is they saw a direct line. There was a direct line from those folks to Edgeworth, to Mill, to Bentham. They understood. Right, that what they were doing was a kind of applied moral philosophy. You still have that. If you look at someone like James Murley's, for example, or Sen, they get it. Right, and unfortunately, and Carol was charged me for you know picking on Eastland. Eastland is a great man. There's no question. He is a great man. But to have a statement in a paper, I use the terms happiness, subjective well-being, satisfaction, utility, well-being, and welfare interchangeably. Now that's fine. If your interests are purely positive, you can call them whatever you want. But if your interests are normative, these are not the same things. Right? It's as if you submitted a paper to the Review of Income and Wealth, and you said, I'm going to use the terms wages, earnings, income, consumption, and wealth interchangeably. I mean, that's laughable. These are different things. Okay? And once we're in the enterprise, you know, we're engaging in this room, these are different things. It may be that the methods converge, but at least in thinking about them, let's start out by trying to be uh, conceptually clear. Um, and one of the things, again, this is a literature that you know, uh, the folks pushing happiness have not read because they're specialized like everyone else. And the philosophers, by the way, have not read the happiness literature very well. Right? Fred Feldman, who's a very good philosopher, really good philosopher, has a book on you know, a happiness where it appears that he's hardly read this literature on happiness. So I'm not, I think the, 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 the the problems here, you know, every side sort of over-specializes and fails to do enough of what the other field is good at. But in any event, one would observe 
If one were to have taken a class in Western philosophy, or if one were to dip into the pages of ethics and philosophy of public affairs, that there are a multiplicity of accounts of well-being. Right? They're different. Now, it may be that the happiness account is right. But philosophers, and part of you know, among as many accomplishments uh, uh, did this. What is well-being? Or at least I'll, I'll use a philosophical language here. Well-being is a matter of what is good for someone. We can talk in general, what, what's good for the world, what's good for the universe. We can also talk about what's good for someone. Right? This seems to be just like goodness and ought is kind of a basic element of normative thinking. So goodness for a person, given that we have these separate units, people, Right? To think about goodness for people seems to be a very basic kind of uh, uh, normative thought. Well-being just is goodness for a person. And then the question is, well, what does that mean? What does that consist of? And here, let's observe the philosophical tradition, going back to Aristotle, has different answers. Now, one kind of answer to, um, you know, what is someone's well-being consistent is experientialist. That's the term I'm going to use here. Um, an experientialist view there are different kinds of experientialist views, and they can be complex. But an experientialist view satisfies uh, uh, a kind of invariance uh, uh, a condition. Right? An experientialist says, if you take two outcomes, two possible worlds, right, in which someone's mental states, all of her mental states, her affects, her cognitions, her preferences, you know, uh, are the same, then she is equally well off. An experientialist account of welfare says you can't make a well-being difference without some kind of change in someone's mental states. Now, all I want to say here, this is in fact just a descriptive point, there are long-standing philosophical views that are out in the literature which are not experientialist. It is possible, and indeed philosophers have been trying to do this for a long time, to have an account of well-being, of what is good for someone, which is not experientialist. Now, those people might be wrong. Right? Experientialism might, in fact, be the best substantive account of well-being. But let's not short-circuit that substantive conversation by definitions, by saying that well-being just is a matter of experiences. Right? And indeed, there are two kinds of views out there, uh, both with, with long roots. I mean, experientialism certainly has long roots. It goes back at least to Bentham. Uh, uh, but there are two other kinds of views of well-being uh, out there in the literature, uh, uh, preference-based views and objective good views, uh, which, and I'm going to sort of focus in in a second on preference-based views, are not experientialist. Right? Both preference-based views and objective good views, objective good views, uh, so preference-based views basically say that someone's well-being consists in the satisfaction of their preferences. Uh, and as I'll uh, uh, drill down on in a, in a moment, that is not an experientialist view. It says that someone's well-being can change even without a change in their mental states. Uh, and then, of course, we have objective good views. Uh, Aristotle, modern uh, exemplars are people like uh, John Finnis, or in a way Martha Nussbaum, who say that someone's well-being is neither wholly a matter of what goes on in their head, nor a matter of realizing those, their preferences. That kind of view, too, is not an experientialist view. Um, OK, so what, at the end of the day, the main contribution of the paper, I think, is to, is to try to engage in a close and careful analysis of the different possible justifications for using uh, you know, happiness surveys and policy design, and more substantively, to suggest skepticism. So although the, you know, the substantive conclusion of the paper is some degree of skepticism about uh, uh, the use of these surveys, that's not really the main contribution. Right, the main contribution is to try to get us to think more carefully. Now, honestly, I think that's not going to have any impact because the literature, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, you know, uh, I'm not an optimist in general. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a sort of depressive, which means I'm, I'm realistic. Uh, uh, um, uh, the empirical literature is not a concept. You don't get stuff published in the Journal of Happiness Studies by being conceptually precise. And frankly, law professors want results. Right? I mean, frankly, you don't get stuff published in the Harvard Law Review by being conceptually precise. So I'm, I, I would love, but anyway, this, it seems to me, is the main contribution here. It's to urge people in this room uh, and uh, 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 the community more generally to be, to, to, to take a step back and not to engage in the kind of conflation that Easterlin, for all of his great contributions, 
uh, ought not have uh, done, and to mush all these concepts together. So in particular, what I want us to do is to differentiate in thinking about the relevance of these happening surveys for policy. Let's think clearly, and let's differentiate what I call in the paper the preference realization defense, right, the view that these are evidence of preference utility. Now, Kahneman, at least, I mean, Kahneman has been, among these many virtues, has been very clear. Kahneman does draw this distinction between preference utility and experience utility, and that's what I want to press. Uh, uh, although, in some ways, I disagree with his conceptualizing. I think he basically has it right. Let's distinguish between the view that happiness surveys are evidence of preference utility as opposed to the view that they're evidence of experience utility. And again, I'm going to go into these distinctions, but this is, the, I think, the core of the paper. It's this map that I want people to have in their heads as they're evaluating different proposals like WBA or uh, like Growth National Happiness and so forth. And within the latter category, if you view these surveys as evidence of experience utility, um, uh, are you taking the strong view that someone's well-being is nothing more than the mental state she experiences, or are you taking the weak view uh, that someone's mental states are simply one component of her uh, well-being? How am I doing, Thomas? Just keep going. Keep going? Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you have some water, maybe. I'll uh, you okay, some. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. Um, okay, so th this is, this is, this is, it's really ur to urge the field to step back and, you know, take a moment to try to locate the proposal, whatever the policy proposal, where is it on this map? I think this is a helpful, I hope at least this is a helpful uh, uh, map. Okay, so let me now talk about preferences because on the upper uh, branch of the tree here, uh, 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 happiness surveys have something to do with uh, preferences. So, that's wrong. Um, as I said before, this is one view of well being. Um, uh, it's a view adopted in classical economics. It's also, people don't think of roles as being preferential. It's roles, if you look, if you get to the end of theory of justice, right, when Rawls talks about, um, you know, someone's good, it is a kind of a preference account. What I want to hammer here is that a preference account is not an experientialist account. That is, on a preference account, it is possible to change someone's well-being by changing features of the world other than what goes on inside her head, other than changing anything that goes on inside her head. Now, why is that? A preference is just a choice connected to ranking of outcomes. Right? To have a preference is to have some kind of ranking of outcomes, different ways, you know, different things that might happen in the future, right or right now, different counterfactuals, and to have that ranking in some sense connected to your choices. The thing that I want to stress here and that I try to stress in the paper is that someone can have an intrinsic preference. Forget about it, you know, you might prefer wealth not because you care about wealth, but because you think wealth is going to lead to other things. But it is perfectly possible on a preference view to have an intrinsic preference for attributes other than your own mental states. Right? To have a ranking of the world such that some of the things driving the ranking are things other than your own affects and feelings of satisfaction and so forth. Again, the preference view in its, at least, you know, uh, simple statement is very general. It's just a ranking. Now, it's a ranking that's got to, you know, sort of satisfy certain basic formal properties like completeness, traditionally, or transitivity. But, you know, within those limitations, anything can drive your ranking. So, for example, if you were to look at standard consumer theory in economics, you were to read a, you know, a graduate or undergraduate, for that matter, uh, a micro textbook, but what the theory says is people have preferences over commodity bundles, not over their own mental states. They're external commodities, right, different goods, and people have preferences over those, and those are perfectly well behaved, right, they're complete, and they're monotonic, and they're continuous, and all these great things, and then all the theory is developed about that. The point there is that, you know, at least in that model, the object of the preference, of course, a preference itself is a mental state, but the point here is that the object of the preference, the feature of outcomes in virtue of which you prefer one or the other in consumer theory is not your own mental states, but commodity bundles. Now, you might say, 
Yeah, fine, but that's just fetishistic, right? And Marta Sand, for example, has famously said, you know, uh, a standard uh, classical economic theory is fetishistic because it thinks that people have intrinsic preferences for commodities, right? Um, so you might say, well, no, the, 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 the kinds of preferences that are relevant to well-being have got to be not just formally well-behaved, but intelligible in some sense. And let's add in a self-interest requirement. I mean, I, I've argued a lot for the proposition that, not surprisingly, the kinds of preferences that are well-being relevant are self-interested preferences. But at least as a conceptual matter, it seems to me, it's perfectly intelligible to have a self-interested preference for something other than what goes on your head. Right? And I like to think about this in terms of what makes us a person. Right? It, you know, in, in, in what does my personhood consist? I mean, I'm not just a brain in the back. I mean, I am. I have a brain, and my brain gives rise to various kinds of mental states, and I can care about that. But I might also care about my health state. So just as I might have an intrinsic preference not to feel pain and to feel pleasure, so I might have an intrinsic preference to be physically more fit or in a better health condition. I don't see the argument that a preference uh, against pain is intelligible while a preference for health is not intelligible. After all, remember, what is the function of pain? The evolutionary function of pain and suffering is as tissue damage detection. So give me the argument that says it makes perfect sense to, to care that you not feel pain, but it doesn't make any kind of sense to have an intrinsic preference for your body not to be damaged. As, at least as a matter of intelligibility, that seems to me to be perfectly intelligible. Now, we are not just passive you know, sensation machines. We also have the capacity for practical rationality. Right, to make choices, to formulate plans, and to act on them. And so it seems to me that it's intelligible also to have a preference for liberty and a preference to you know, have goals in the world uh, and to act on uh, those goals and to accomplish those goals. We're also cognizing beings. We have the capacity for knowledge. Now, Aristotle thought that knowledge was the highest form of the good. I'm not claiming that. What I'm saying is that it's perfectly intelligible, it seems to me, for someone to have a preference for knowledge to want to have knowledge. Now, what is knowledge? Anyone? The philosophers say knowledge is not just justified belief. Knowledge is justified true belief. It consists in a mental state that hooks up with the world in the right way. Right? If you believe stuff that's wrong, that's not knowledge. So if you really have a preference for knowledge, then what you want is not just that you have certain beliefs in your head, but that they be true. That is not just a feature of your own head. Now. Um, uh, Robert Nozick has a famous example which tries to highlight this, where he says, you know, imagine that you could enter into an experience machine, you could program in whatever experiences you want, uh, uh, would you, uh, and by stepping in the machine, you'd forget that you were a machine, would you do it? And uh, he says, no, of course you wouldn't do it. Now, what he wants to try to show by that is that well-being has got to be more than just experiences. My claim here is weaker. My claim here is that it is intelligible, not mandatory. It's quite possible that there are people out there like John who just wants to be happy, or Richard Layer. I mean, there are lots of people like that. And that's fine. A preference if you admit that. But what I want to claim is that the key point of the paper is that it's possible for someone to have an intrinsic preference for things like health, the fulfillment of goals, relationships. That's something else I should say, right? That, and by the way, let me know, I see in the paper. The evidence suggests it's not clear that any of these things are great for happiness. Not clear that having more liberty is great for happiness. Barry Schwartz has worked on that. Uh, not clear that education is great for happiness. It's not clear that those who pursue a graduate education end up being happier. Uh, not clear, by the way, that having kids makes you happy. There's a lot of data that you know, people think, well, you know, maybe frustrating at the time, but over the long term, people with parents or who parents are happier. No, there's no evidence of that. And yet lots of people want to have kids. Now, maybe that's mad as a matter of, you know, as a matter, bad as a matter of global warming, but as a matter of well-being, it seems to me perfectly intelligible to think that one of the things I want to do is to have kids and to have a kind of real relationship with my kids, right, and not to be deceived, for example, about what uh, is going on with my kids. The key thing here is that it is possible, not mandatory, possible, right, for someone to have a, a, an intelligible self-interested preference for things other than her own mental states. Now, one other thing I would say is that that's not to say that it's intelligible for people, for someone to be totally stoic. I'm not saying that. 
right? I think sort of a standard preference is a kind of a hybrid preference, right? Uh, that is, I want something out there in the world. I want to accomplish something. I want to have a good family life. Uh, I want to uh, 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 have knowledge. And I want to be aware of that and feel satisfied by that. But that kind of hybrid preference, this is, this is constantly conflated by the literature. A hybrid preference for some external event and the recognition and the satisfaction of that happening is not the same as a preference to feel satisfied. Here's my example, and this is a, you know, uh, um, a local example. Uh, but, you know, as a scholar, I have a preference, and a teacher, I have a preference to produce good scholarship and to be a good teacher. Now, part of doing that well is caring a lot about it. And part of caring a lot about it is feeling anxious and frustrated and worried about how a class went and about how the article went. If you said to me, you know something, we're going to put you in therapy that will make you feel a little less anxious and nervous, feel a little more satisfied with your pedagogic and scholarly accomplishments, but by the way, by feeling a little more satisfied, you'll be a little less good of a teacher and a little right one to your articles. Which would you choose? I think you know the answer. I'd say, I want, it's not that I want to feel satisfied, and of course I don't want to be visibly impressed, but my goal, or at least one part of my goal, is to really be a good scholar and a good teacher, and not just to feel the satisfaction of that. And that also makes a real, you know, this is not, I mean, it, 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 it's a thought experiment, but I don't think, think it has a real, uh, real world implications, and I'm you know, interested to hear what Carol has to say about this. One of the things that emerged in the literature, Carol has worked on this, is the fact that in developing countries, the countries move you know, um, from third world to middle class, there's a lot of frustration. As people have more liberties and income, their expectations go up, and they feel less satisfied. They also feel jealous of people who are moving up even faster. So do this thought experiment. Imagine saying to someone in one of those countries, hey, we can pursue a South Korea or China-like development path, and we'll take you from your peasant life and you'll have all these new opportunities and liberties and more leisure and so forth, but you're also going to feel more frustrated. You actually feel less satisfied with your life with all this stuff. Do you want to do it? It seems to me perfectly intelligible for someone to say, yes, I want to do that. I want the additional resources and liberties and so forth that go along with development, even though I recognize that that might actually push down my satisfaction. Now, again, the claim is not that everyone has that preference, but that is possible. Preference, I, I've spent a lot of time on this because this is where I get pushed back. But this, I think, is absolutely crucial. Uh, and it's crucial to understanding what preference utility is. Preference utility has nothing to do with feelings and satisfactions and so forth. I mean, maybe it shows up in our feelings uh, and, and cognitions, but preference utility is a mathematical object. It's a mathematical representation of the degree to which your preferences are realized. And I'm not even going to say satisfaction, because again, satisfaction is one of those bad words, which is ambiguous, between the actual realization of what you want and a feeling of satisfaction, right? A preference utility function is simply a mathematical object that has the feature such that if you prefer this outcome to that outcome, then uh, the function gives that a higher uh, value, right? And if it turns out, again, often these are not the only examples, but often the examples of a preference for something other than uh, mental states uh, uh, is brought home by examples where you have preference not to be deceived. I prefer that my spouse not betray me. I prefer that my colleagues not laugh behind my back. All this kind of stuff, right? If that's my preference, then if X is a world in which my colleagues don't laugh behind my back and Y is a world in which they laugh behind my back, then my utility is higher in X. That's what utility is in the preference utility sense. Okay, now, John says, but of course, and John's not the only one. Richard Laird, now Lord Laird, has said in the first edition, now the second edition of his book, but people just want to be happy. It may be true that as a conceptual matter that you can have preference for non-experiential states, but in practice, empirically, people want to be happy. Now let me say, I'm happy to have the conceptual argument. I'm happy to have the substantive argument. You may be right. I think it's a plausible case to be made that the best analysis of self-interest is in terms of experiences. I don't think that. But that, that's, a, you know, that's a perfectly valid, you know, incontestable, substantive point. As an empirical matter, we just don't know. And indeed, one of the shocking things to me is that 
while we have a gazillion studies talking about the effect of different conditions on feelings of satisfaction, that is not the same as asking people to what extent do you care only about your experiences. That has been very little studied. That needs much more studied. That needs much more studied. We just do not know. We just do not know. And I should say, to the extent that it has been studied, the literature certainly does not suggest that there's a universal right, uh, uh, preference structure such that people only want to be happy. I mean, my guess is a lot of people in this country want to do God's will, whatever that is. Like, for example, I mean, it's also shocking to me that uh, 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 how secular this literature is. I'm secular too. But, you know, let's think about the preferences of religious people. But in any event, to the extent this has been studied, right, what is it that people want for themselves? Right? That work certainly does not demonstrate that people only, or that everyone only, maybe there are populations that are um, uh, experientialists in their preferences, but there's uh, plenty of evidence that there are others. So, for example, in this small study that I did with Paul Dolan, uh, who is the person spearhead, now spearheading uh, the UK efforts to, to engage in happiness research. Um, we uh, 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 describe different hypothetical lives that people uh, 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 might live. Uh, we describe them both in terms of um, non-hedonic attributes like the income that you'd have, uh, how long you'd live. But we also describe them in terms of uh, the happiness. So one possible life was you, know, you would be in a good mood 30% you know, of the time. Another life was you'd be in a good mood 50% of the time. And we asked them to, to, to rank uh, lives. And then based on that, we did a regression that looked at what, to what extent were these different attributes predicting the ranking. If people care just about happiness, the coefficient on all those things except happiness would be zero. Well, that was not the case. People cared about their health and their uh, income. They also cared about happiness, but that certainly was not the only thing they cared about. Uh, the people who are really doing this, and they should be applauded, and their stuff is being published in top journals, in AER, uh, uh, Danny Benjamin uh, and Ori Efforts, Efforts uh, Miles Kimball, uh, Alex Rees-Jones, uh, uh, Nicole Sembrat at Cornell have been doing a series of studies that look at this with really uh, sophisticated techniques. Um, uh, they just did this study. This blows my mind. They took medical students who um, were, had just put in their match. You guys know that, you know. Uh, uh, you put in, you, you, you're selected into a medical residency uh, by submitting uh, uh, a ranking. And they got permission to do this. Uh, uh, and this is, real, this is not out there. I mean, I think it may not even be out there. They um, uh, um, uh, got the top four residencies. And then they asked the students to, one, describe those in terms of how much happiness they anticipated happening, experiencing during the residency, both during the time of the residency and over the rest of their lives. So they, one, got a measure of anticipated happiness during the residency. Um, uh, and they had that as well as the actual choice, right? So they had the anticipated happiness and the actual choice. And then they also asked them to characterize different residency in terms of you know, other things like which is the most convenient, which is the most prestigious, which will be the most stressful uh, in terms of your uh, 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 personal life, and then they did regressions where both the anticipated happiness and the choice was regressed onto these different attributes. Now, if people care just about happiness, the coefficients would be the same, but they're not. They're very different. They're very different. Um, Peter Ubel, uh, who's done a lot of great work, and feel free to correct my characterization, but you know, did this great Rotten study. Work. What? Rotten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 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 looking at uh, uh, contrasting uh, qualities and happiness values. Well, qualities uh, uh, are a way to whereby people express their preferences for health states. The study looked at quality values among people uh, 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 with colostomies and particularly asked them uh, um, how much of your life would you give up for a return to perfect health without the colostomy. Now, what's interesting is that if you ask you know, people who've never had a colostomy, you know, how bad is it to have a colostomy, they give really low values. People who are currently experiencing, uh, currently, you know, currently, uh, experiencing the condition give higher values than the general population, but they still give values less than unity. There's, they still express a willingness to sacrifice some duration of life right, uh, in exchange for a return to perfect health without the colostomy state. The other thing which is dramatic is that these guys looked at the moment-to-moment -moment affects of people 
having colostomies, and they're just as good as members of the general population. Presumably, or one interpretation of the study is that these people with colostomies understand that they adapt, their moves are just as good, but they still prefer health intrinsically. Now, there are different ways to interpret the study, but the point here is that I'm not, again, the claim here is not that no one should have preferences like John. The claim is that it's possible and intelligible to have preferences unlike those of John or Richard Later, that is the preference for happiness, and we are far from knowing empirically that no one has those preferences. Right? So therefore, until that's established, until we've got data and data and data to establish that, which I don't think it will be established, we should go forward on the assumption that if one has a preference-based view of well-being, that the people with the preferences uh, can have preferences for things other than uh, their own mental states. Okay. So that's back to this. This is why this is so important. If it were the case that it was unintelligible to have a preference for something other than one's experiences, or if it were the case that we could just sort of assume as a rough cut that everyone prefers their happiness, then this whole chart would not be necessary. But it's not. People can, as far as we know, do have preferences for things like health, liberty, relationships, accomplishment, and so forth, which are not just a matter of their own mental states. And given that, we then have to distinguish between preference utility, a measure of the realization of someone's preferences and experience utility. And we, we have to think about the extent to which surveys are you know, evidence of one or the other. All right. How much time? Five minutes. Five minutes. All right. I'm going to have to go, go quickly. So <laughs> let me just say, I do not think. Now, some happiness scholars, Layard, Kahneman, um, uh, the trio here, do not think of happiness surveys as, as evidence of preference utility. Right? They don't think that. I mean, I, so I, I don't think they are. They don't think that. That's fine. But there are plenty of people out there. If you read this literature that I mentioned earlier, using happiness surveys to come up with monetary equivalents, there are plenty of people there. Again, in fact, these people are, they're economists, right? They still have that professional credential. So they're straddling the world. So they want to say, well, utility is preference utility. They're not willing, they're not able to make the break that you guys have made. And so there are plenty of people who at least, you know, avowedly think of happiness surveys as evidence of preference utility. And so we need to think about that. Now, I think that, that doesn't work for lots of reasons. I talk about the paper. Uh, uh, I can spend more time in Q&A on that. Uh, uh, I think their, the thought experiment is, again, willingness to pay. We um, uh, start with some baseline bundle of Y income and Z, which is some non-income good. And then we say, all right, we're going to increase the level of Z by delta Z. What is willingness to pay? It is the reduction in Y, the quantity delta Y, such that the person would be indifferent between the initial bundle YZ and the new bundle Z plus delta Z, Y minus delta Y. And then the thought in this literature with dozens of papers is, hey, we can use happiness surveys to figure out this willingness to pay about, which again is amount defined in terms of preference utility. We can say, infer that if Amy says, I'm at level seven in terms of happiness or life satisfaction with YZ, and that Bob says, I'm at level seven with Y minus delta Y, Z plus delta uh, Z, they both must be indifferent, right? Delta Z must be the willingness to pay amount, sorry, delta Y must be the willingness to pay amount for delta Z. Now, there are lots of problems with that. <laughs> lots of problems with that. That is not the way to do it. The bottom line here is that if we are trying to come up with willingness to pay amounts, and you guys are not, but if we're trying to come up with willingness to pay amounts, which again are equivalating, right, compensating amounts in terms of preference utility, then what's our choice? We could use for field preference data. Now, that's got some problems, but, you know, at least your money is where your mouth is, right? The concern with surveys is they're hypothetical and so forth. The claim I want to make is that, and again, I'm going to, you know, go quickly here, is that if one wants to use surveys and not just for field preference data to come up with these willingness to pay, uh, amounts. And again, that's not what these guys want to do. Um, uh, standard stated preference surveys are better than a happiness surveys. All right, I'll skip over that. I mean, a lot of the paper, though, a lot of the attack on CBA is an attack on wealth effects, or at least a substantial amount of the paper is an attack on that kind of stuff, uh, uh, an attack on uh, the Cowder Hicks view of CBA. I, too, you know, uh, 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 
think the Cauterich's view of CBA is problematic. I mean, I wrote this book with Eric attacking a Cauterich's view of CBA when you guys were in diapers, which you, you know, uh, credit me. So I'm, we're, we're on the same page there. I'm not going to defend CBA on Cauterich's uh, terms. The better way, and this is my new book, right, defense of CBA, sees it as a way to implement a social welfare function. Right? And ideally, you would do that not by just summing up loan to pay amounts, but by using distributive ways. That's going to get around, if one does that right, a lot of the problems with wealth that you talk about in the paper. Now, of course, it's difficult to specify those weights. To come up with those weights, you need not just an ordinal, but a cardinal, interpersonally comparable preference utility function. And we can talk about how to do that. But the bottom line here is that happiness surveys are not the way to get at that. Now, again, you're not going to deny that, but just to be uh, uh, clear. Okay. So, two possible views of uh, uh, on this, the, the lower branch of the, t uh, the tree, uh, viewing happiness surveys as evidence of experience utility. One possibility is layered view, which is a better my view. It's experientialism. It's just it's that the way to make people better off is just by changing their experiences. Right? Nothing that happens to someone outside their own head can intrinsically affect their well-being. Now, maybe that's the right view. I just want to note here that's a very controversial view. It's been argued about you know, since uh, Bentham. Um, uh, Layard's arguments for it are bad. It's not that the view might not be, maybe the view is right, but Layard gives us some really bad arguments. He says, well, if you have multiple goods, that's a problem. You know, maximizing happiness is monistic. Well, we know that even on the experientialist view, there are multiple components to good experience. There's effective experience. There's feeling of satisfaction and so forth. He says, only happiness is self-evident intrinsic value. Ask Aristotle. I mean, Aristotle thought that knowledge, and Aristotle's modern you know, uh, 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 version, John Finnis, thinks knowledge has self-evident intrinsic value. The thing that really gets me is the claim that happiness is anti-paternalistic. Now, I have no trouble with paternalism. Right? But let's not inflate the virtues of experientialism by saying that experientialism is anti-paternalistic. Right? To say we should maximize someone's happiness is to say we should maximize their, his happiness even in the teeth of their preference for something else. That, that, that paternalistic implication of the experientialist view is only mitigated if it's true empirically that people all, in general only prefer their own happiness, but that's not true. We don't know that. So this is potentially a paternalistic view. Right? Uh, a better argument, which Layer doesn't make in neither the first edition or the second, second edition of this book, is this issue of remoteness, that what happens to me has got to be, sorry, what is good for me has got to be about me in some sense. It's got to be not too remote from me. Right? What happens in the 23rd century may be good or bad for the world, it's not good for me. And so then the thought is, well, the way to cash this non-remoteness requirement is to say that everything except what occurs in someone's head is too remote for her. OK. Um, Weak defense Kahneman, I have a long discussion in the paper. Uh, Kahneman used to be like layered, now Kahneman is more in this, you know, uh, happiness is only one thing that matters. And I would say I, I think that's right. The claim that happiness or that experiences are the only constituent of well-being is highly controversial. The claim that they're one constituent of well-being seems to me very plausible. In particular, it seems to be very plausible that most people, among other things, if not kind of radical Stoics, will care about their own experiences. Um, so Kahneman then tries to operationalize that uh, through this theoretical framework uh, uh, and then through these studies. I've got various uh, uh, comments. What he is trying to do fundamentally is to come up with a cardinal and interpersonally comparable measure of momentary experience utility. Right? And he does that by imagining an observer ranking profiles so we got a profile of experiences. We have an observer who ranks them. The observer ranks them consistently with certain axioms like separability and so forth. And lo and behold, we can show there is a cardinal measure of momentary utility which some represents the ranking of the profiles. Nice. Problem is he doesn't actually use that in the empirical work, right? Just the ranking kind of drops out. But that, this is the theory. And this is, again, I want to say happiness is uh, one thing. Uh, uh, and this is maybe is a way to uh, measure it. All right, so let me, let me end here by talking about uh, uh, a well-being analysis. Um, BBM, or 
horrible acronym. Uh, John, Chris, and John. Uh, um, uh, 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 I mean, their view, and this is, they, you know, they have a, a, a wonderful earlier article where they, they, you know, argue it this way for length. They're like layered. They have a strong view, which says that the best account of well-being is experientialist. Right? That's their view, and they view well-being analysis as a way to uh, uh, implement that. We can argue about that, but if I'm right that layered is wrong, then that would apply equally to uh, uh, their view. Now, there's a different way to take the view. This is not their intention, I think, but there's a different way to take the view, which is to take them as doing something like what Kahneman is doing. Right? On this sort of weaker view, well-being analysis is a way to evaluate policies in light of experiences, but recognizing that there might be sort of non-experiential non dimensions that are also significant. Now, we can talk about you know, whether WBA makes sense understood in this light. Again, this is not their intentions because they are experientialists about well-being. I guess my objection here is that, unlike Kahneman, I mean, Kahneman, although he sort of dropped in the empirical implication, worked very hard to come up with a theory of how to construct a cardinal, interpersonally powerful uh, measure of well-being. These guys don't. And I think that's the problem. Right now, what they say in the paper is, eh, it doesn't really matter. Let's just assume that there is something, you know, experiential utility, which is there in some sense in everyone's heads. As long as the surveys, as long as variation in the answers that the surveys give is random, it doesn't really matter what that is, it doesn't really matter how we design the surveys, we're getting at that. Now, frankly, I think that's really problematic. For if that were true, then that would mean, for example, that there, there should be no systematic variation between life satisfaction and effective surveys. Because these all, both might be just ways of getting at cardinal experience utility, but of course there are. Of course there are. So I got, I got, again, this is not kind of law professor stuff, but I do, and I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this weaker reading of the view, but you need a theory. Right? You need a theory. Now let me just close by talking about their critique of cost-benefit. Um, I think the way I would put this is, it seems to me to compare WBA and CBA is a kind of apples to oranges comparison. What is CBA? CBA is the best technique out there. Now I think it can be refined in various ways, like, you know, by using distributed weights and so forth. But it is the best technique out there for operationalizing a preference-based view of well-being in terms of policy analysis. It's what we've arrived at. John, John, and Chris do not give us a better kind of how to do that. They don't view WBA as a better way to sort of operate, operationalize preference utility. They view it as a way to operationalize a different account of well-being. So the critique of CBA, it seems to me, is really just a red herring. What they're objecting to is the preference-based view of well-being. Right? If they can show, as they tried in the previous paper, that that view is problematic, then let's go with WBA. But if they can't, then it seems to me that criticizing CBA is besides the point because CBA, again, is the best developed technique we have for operationalizing that. Now, I'm going to close with an analogy. My wife uh, uh, never ceases to remind me that I have really bad analogies, but I was trying to think of an analogy uh, to make this point, so uh, this may fall flat. So the analogy is this. Imagine that you know, someone is about to dive into the ocean wearing scuba gear. And, you know, scuba gear is heavy, there's a wetsuit, uh, it's sort of heavy, it's odd looking, it restrains your mobility, you got a face mask, you got an uh, 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 air tank, and uh, a runner comes up to the person and says, gee, what are you wearing all that gear for? Look what I'm wearing. I got running shoes and shorts and a shirt, I'm comfortable, I'm not, I can do what I want. Uh, you know, why are you wearing all that stuff? To which the scuba diver says, this is the way to scuba dive. I mean, the way to persuade someone you know, uh, 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 not to wear scuba gear, uh, as opposed to running gear, is not to point out how much more difficult scuba gear is. It's to persuade them not to scuba dive. Right? If you want to go scuba dive, then you've got to wear scuba gear. Right? And by the way, to decide whether to go scuba diving or just running, right? You don't make that assessment by looking at whether scuba gear is clumpier than running uh, gear. I mean, similarly, CBA is a way to implement a much more nuanced, I would want to say, uh, and complex view of well-being. 
WBA is, is, is a way to implement a view of well-being which I view as being wrongheaded and a simpler. If that's the right view of well-being, then CPA is problematic, but it's not problematic just by virtue of its complexity. All right, so let me stop there and uh, shut up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Adler. Um, two points. So one, um, I just want to address something that Professor Adler said, and that's that um, the Duke Law Journal does publish substantively precise pieces, which is why we've <laughs> uh, asked all of you yeah. to publish with us. And two, um, <laughs> I've done a uh, less than stellar job of keeping us on schedule. So I want to have a little bit of a scheduling conversation before I let uh, the three authors respond to the analogy, if, if you want. Um, so the, the caterers did kind of the exact opposite of what we were hoping. They brought our lunches early, but they are portable. And so what I'm so maybe in the effort of respecting the stomachs and the watches of our panel members that are coming up after this, is um, once the authors of the other piece get a chance to respond, I would like to dismiss everyone to the hall to pick up lunches and then come back and maybe we'll turn our our first panel into a, a lunch panel type type thing if that's okay. Um, so maybe we can get the microphones to the three of you. If you want to respond now or if you would like to, um, I presume that you might want to say something, but... <laughs> okay, um, Melissa's bringing you a mic right now. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna take a crack at this, but I'm curious if Jonathan or Chris uh, has different things they wanna say, uh, you know, which obviously uh, add to it or change it or disagree with what I'm going to say. Um, so I think this is fantastic. As I said, as usual, um, you know, very, very <coughs> smart and thoughtful and perceptive. I mean, Matt, you already know what I'm going to say about all of this, but for the benefit of everybody else. Uh, so first of all, as you know, and as you said, we, uh, we've engaged in this normative argument in the previous paper. We take these distinctions seriously, you know, and we think that, uh, that the right view of well-being is um, enjoyment of life or how good people feel moment by moment. Um, okay, so we think that. We think if, if the right way to go about this, as you say, is to figure out first what is welfare, uh, then the best way to figure out what is welfare is happiness. Second, uh, as I said initially, I think there is a lot of convergence between preferences and happiness, especially your kind of idealized preferences and happiness. So you say, we just don't know. But a lot of times when you think about it, in common sense, when people are thinking about what's best for them, what they would like for them, why they care about health, and that life expectancy is, I think, best explained by the fact that they <laughs> think in many cases correctly that they'll be happier if they're healthier and they'll be happier if they have more money, and you know, in some cases that's correct, uh, and they'll be certainly happier if they live longer. They have more time to be happy and most people are generally happy with their lives. Uh, but even, and even if we're wrong about everything, you know, even if uh, preferences rather than, well, than happiness is uh, the best account of well-being, and uh, there are very, very many cases where the two things do not converge, at a minimum, in the remaining cases, which I think every, you yourself said that you know, sometimes happiness uh, it's valuable. Uh, I think many people believe that happiness is valuable a lot of the time. Uh, and, and I think it's clear to most people, including you, that uh, there are going to be many cases where happiness and preferences are the same. At a minimum, in those cases, the criticisms we make about CBA, I think, are relevant. If when happiness and preferences are the same thing, which they often are, well-being analysis is better than cost-benefit analysis at getting at that thing, then well-being analysis should be used as a supplement to cost-benefit analysis. Um, I, I guess, you know, it's hard to know what to say in two minutes after a presentation like that, which, as John said, was, uh, was fabulous and extremely detailed. I guess I want to say a couple things about a couple points you make on this particular slide here. So one about the interpersonally comparable and cardinal indicator, and Chris talked about this in our earlier presentation. You know, you're right, we don't have a theory about how to create one. We recognize that, we identified that as the number one problem with using well-being data uh, back when, you know, you were in diapers, I think. Um, <laughs> and Kahneman doesn't have one either, by the way. Kahneman's uh, method is not successful. So what we do in the paper is we explain why in practical terms we don't think it's going to be all that important, actually, and why these cardinal issues are going to drop out of the equation when we're just trying to do actual policy analysis in a lot of cases. I mean, you know, that may, be, that may be right, may be wrong, but 
you know, we're trying to make a, we're trying to create a practical decision procedure. So the question is not, do we have a grand theory? The question is, practically speaking, what, what difference will this make? We have reasons why it will not. And by the way, another decision procedure that does not have a theory of how to construct an interpersonally comparable and cardinal indicator is cost-benefit analysis. It has exactly the same problem as we point out in the paper. Cost-benefit analysis gets around this by doing precisely what we do, which is saying, in practical terms, this is going to drop out uh, and not be that important. So. You know, the, the difficulty you point to is, is the difficulty that we have, which we acknowledge, and the difficulty that cost-benefit analysis has as well. Um, the second sort of critique you make here, the second difficulty you identify, is really related to this critique of CBA, which touches on what John was just saying. Cost-benefit analysis is a welfareist decision procedure, which I believe was written by two people named Adler and Posner in 2006. So it's based on a preference-based view of welfare. You know, we think that our view is a preference-based view of welfare as well. We just think that people, generally speaking, have preferences over mental states. But as John is saying, you know, maybe they don't. Maybe we're wrong about that. Maybe they have preferences for other things. And if that's the case, that's fine. Okay, so we're all trying to measure, in some sense, preferences. CBA does it in an ex-ante version. I think this is a nice framing that uh, Jonathan Wiener offered a bit ago. WBA does it in an ex-post uh, sort of way. We're looking at the outcomes when people's preferences are or are not satisfied. So. The two really are quite comparable in that sense because they're both geared at the same thing and they're both just looking at different data that bear on that same question. You might argue that CBA is getting better data because by using prices we capture things other than mental states and that's really valuable. I think we're going to argue that by looking at mental states we're getting much more accurate measures than we would get by looking at prices and then in fact at bottom, and we could have a whole conversation about this, it's mental states and not you know, these other things that people really deeply care about. But in any event, we're certainly both aiming at the same thing. So I, I, don't, I don't think that this, the point that you know, this, the scuba diving and running, which I, an, a great analogy that I got a little bit lost in, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is apt here. I think that we're all going for the same thing. And the question is just which gets, which gets there better, which does a better job of measuring that quantity. Let me, OK. So. We're not, I mean, I would prefer, it's a great paper, I'm happy the journal is publishing this. In a way, I would prefer a paper which said, in our previous work, we, we presented very strong normative arguments for experientialism. We are in the line that includes you know, uh, uh, Bentham and Edgeworth and early Kahneman and Laird and Fred Feldman and other people like that, and all that affects your well-being is what goes on in your head. I mean, that's a, it's not my view, it's a plausible view. You might append to that, I mean, there's this, there's this debate within the literature of personal identity between uh, people who say that personhood is just psychological and so-called animalists who say that personhood is part of a matter of being, having a human body. You could say, no, personal identity and personhood is just psychological. You could say, by virtue of that, it's really, and then to say, you know, and given that this is the view, we presented normative arguments for this. It doesn't matter what people prefer. It doesn't matter whether people prefer non experiential goods. This is the most persuasive, least plausible view. Let's now think about how to operationalize that. And then the WDA does that. And then again, CBA, which does not purport to do that, even if CBA were perfect, right, were easy, it would still be problematic because WBA is a better way to implement that view, right? Um, instead of saying that, you say two things. One is that, well, we could use conversion. I don't think they do. So, for example, at the level of that Laird is concerned about, which is kind of macroeconomic, I mean, let me back up. And again, bring to play Rawls, right? What is Rawls? You know, Rawls thinks famously about failed ignorance, Rawls thinks about Lex of Men, but also Rawls thinks about different primary goods. He says, we're going to think about justice as the distribution of different primary goods, liberties, opportunities, and, oh, by the way, wealth. Why wealth? Because wealth is, as Rawls says, of all purpose means. Wealth enables you to do lots of different things. If you want to travel, if you want to learn, if you want to you know, engage in various projects, wealth enables you to do that. So if, to the extent that people have non-experiential preferences, they may want to earn money, not because of consumption fetishism, but because they view wealth as a way to facilitate all these other goals. So what that means is that if you look at the trade-off between wealth and non-market goods in terms of preference utility as opposed to experience utility, the trade-offs are different. It's not surprising that in these happiness studies, the coefficient of wealth is very small because wealth, it seems, does make little impact to happiness. But the point is that people have lots of good reasons for wanting wealth beyond their own happiness. 
And so the practical implications at the macroeconomic level is if you're with Laird, less development, higher taxation. You don't really care about the labor incentives, right, of higher taxation. Uh, less GDP, full employment. It would mean, for example, that a, uh, uh, a central bank should really put employment at the center of its mandate as opposed to employment and inflation. Microeconomically, for example, in these studies, right, happiness-based equivalents for air pollution are much, the dollar value is much higher. It means that we're going to regulate much more stringently. So I don't think it doesn't make a difference. I think the evidence suggests it doesn't make a difference. Nor do I think that the evidence suggests that people just prefer their own happiness. These are just different views. And I, I mean, I, so it's, I mean, it's a good paper, but I think, in a way, I'd like a paper which said, we've shown we're in this at least plausible school that says that experiences and well-being are the same thing. Now, let's operationalize that. Now, to do that, I'm, I'm not objecting to the cardinality point. I think you're right. Whatever the view. So on my view, we need a cardinal measure of preference utility, certainly to do distributed weights. On your view, you need a cardinal measure of experience utility. That's fine. And I think I, I'm, I'm not going to, I think there is one. But on this view of what you're doing, I think you do need to do the theoretical work to figure out what that is and then figure out how to implement it. Okay. So I think we should stop for lunch now and try to get back in here as close to 12.15 as possible. But we'll plan to start the next panel at 12.20. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.